Good evening. I hope uh, everybody's having a wonderful uh, holiday season, getting ready to, to celebrate the season with uh, family and friends. Um, today, we're going to be doing something a little different. Uh, our host this evening is actually a uh, second year dermatology resident in Arizona, uh, Dr. Mike McBride, and uh, he's agreed to uh, to uh, guide us through uh, a series of uh, disorders uh, characterized by acanthalysis, uh, some high yield diagnoses, and um, we just thought it'd be uh, quite interesting and instructive to uh, to have a session uh, run by uh, a resident colleague. Uh, and um, anyway, we're we're thrilled that Mike agreed. Uh, as always, if you have any uh, questions for us, um, you can uh, go ahead and use the chat or you can uh, submit them to uh, Sages, uh, education at sagesdx.com or you can email me directly, tdavis at sagesdx.com. Hope everybody has a uh, great evening. And uh, Mike, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Thank you to Sages Diagnostics for allowing me to come on and share some slides for Dermpath Happy Hour. Uh, if you weren't able to look at the slides before, and I'll just say that everything we're going to be looking at is part of the vascular bolus eruption pattern, particularly those diseases that also exhibit some form of acanthalysis too. Uh, whenever you see a pathology slide, you want to make sure you have some stepwise approach to help organize your thoughts and come up with a differential diagnosis. For vesicular bolus lesions, the first thing you can try to do is determine the level of the split. So is it a subcorneal process that's going on? Is it within the epidermis or intraepidermal, superbasilar or subepidermal? If it's subepidermal, sometimes there's inflammatory cells present within the dermis that can kind of help steer you towards the correct diagnosis. And then the second thing you want to do is determine what's causing the vesicular bolus lesion to occur. So is it increased spongiosis between keratinocytes causing discohesion? Is it an autoimmune driven process? against adhesion molecules like desmoglein that's causing acanthalysis, um, or is it a secondary acanthalysis um, process like we see in ballooning degeneration from viruses? So with that being said, I'll try to remember that with each slide that we see here tonight. Uh, but we'll get started with the first one. So we have a punch biopsy. We have absence of our granular layer. Keratinocytes are somewhat more pale. And then we have dilated blood vessels as well as salivary gland tissue. So putting that all together, we're on an oral mucosal surface. And as we go to higher magnification, we can see within the vesicular bolus lesion here, the basal keratinocytes are adherent to the basement membrane, but we do see that they have lost um, adhesion to their neighboring keratinocytes. So when we see this along the basement membrane zone, this is referred to as tombstoning. And as we look for other areas of involvement, we can see that the, again, the keratinocytes are losing adhesion to one another. The cytoplasm is becoming more eosinophilic so those two together make you think of a more acantholytic process. And the overlying keratinocytes are going to be spared. So putting that together, we have a superbasilar vesicular bolus lesion with acantholysis um, on an oral mucosal surface. So you should think about pemphigus vulgaris, which was what this one was. So an autoimmune example of an acantholytic vesicular bolus lesion. The antigen involved is desmoglein 3, which is commonly expressed in the lower mucosal surfaces or epidermis. And that explains why you're getting your superbasilar split. You also have compensation from other adhesion, adhesion molecules that are more superficial, like desmoglein 1. Um, you can get a pemphigus vulgaris mucocutaneous eruption where you do lose desmoglein 1 or loss of desmoglein 1 from autoantibodies as well. To monitor these patients clinically, you can get an indirect immunofluorescence. So the substrate for that is going to be monkey esophagus. And then pemphigus vulgaris, sometimes the initial lesions are just going to be eosinophilic spongiosis with no vascular changes. So something else to note, but this one here, an example of an autoimmune driven process of acanthalysis, uh, pemphigus vulgaris. So the second one we have, again, another punch biopsy, we can see from low magnification that we have a mixed inflammatory infiltrate within the superficial dermis, some overlying epidermal hyperplasia as well. And as we go to higher magnification, we can see that the stratum corneum has been lost. So the stratum corneum is gone. And within the granular layer, the keratinocytes are showing more hyperchromatic nuclei and signs of acanthalysis. So thinking why the stratum corneum is gone, it's likely a vesicular bolus lesion that's occurring. <clears throat> and we've just lost the stratum corneum. So this is within our subcorneal differential diagnosis. So you should start thinking about pepigus foliaceus, staph scarlet skin syndrome, uh, bolus and petigo. With bolus and patigo, you'd think to see more neutrophils and bacterial components, and then to distinguish between staph scalded skin syndrome and 
uh, pump vigus foliaceus, so you're going to need direct immunofluorescence because they're both, both acting with desmoglium 1. So this entity here, this was pemphigus foliaceus. So another example of an autoimmune-driven acantholytic process. Like we said, the <coughs> antigen here is going to be desmoglium 1 that's expressed more superficial epidermis. Um, some clinical variants to note with pemphigus foliaceus, you can get pemphigus erythematosus with pemphigus foliaceus lupus overlap, commonly seen within the malar regions. Uh, direct immunofluorescence there is going to show your classic intraepidermal IgG, typically subclass 4 to desmoglium 1, but also granular deposition of IgG and C3 along the basement membrane zone, more consistent with a lupus picture. The other one to note is phogosalvagem. So phogosalvagem is a pemphigus foliaceous clinical eruption commonly seen in Brazil. Uh, patients involved are going to be younger, living along a riverbed, exposed to the black fly and specifically the species with that is the Smilian species. Indirect immunofluorescence for this is going to be guinea pig esophagus as your substrate. Um, so again, just another example of an autoimmune-driven acantholytic process. It's a little more superficial. Pemphigus foliaceus is number two. So moving on to number three here. We have a shave biopsy, and we can already see where the pathology lies. So it's involving majority of the epidermis here. We have a hair follicle that appears to be spared. And as we go to higher magnification, the keratinocytes here, again, most of the epidermis, so intraepidermal, the basal layers, is spared, overlying keratinocytes appear to be uninvolved. And then this area here is a, a good example of what we're looking for. So this is the characteristic finding within this disease process. So when the acantholytic cells start to stumble over one another, they're said to resemble a dilapidated brick wall. So that's pretty characteristic for this disease process. So with that being said, this is Haley-Haley disease. So Haley-Haley disease is an example of an inherited process causing the acantholysis, unlike the first two. Uh, the gene involved is going to be ATP2C1. And the way you can remember that is one day I want to see Haley's Comet. It's an autosomal dominantly inherited um, defect within that gene. And the protein that it encodes for is a calcium ATP is within the Golgi apparatus. So down the road, you'll get acantholytic changes on histopath. It can reveal or, you know, look like pemphigus vulgaris on histopathology. And if you're lucky enough to get a hair follicle, Haley-Haley disease will spare it, where pemphigus vulgaris will show that acantholytic changes tracking down the hair follicle. So another example of acantholysis, but this time it's an inherited defect that's, that's causing it. <laughs> so moving on to slide number four here. Again, we have another shave biopsy. We can see overlying orthohyperkeratosis, some areas of hypergranulosis, follicular plugging. And the acantholysis that's occurring is a little more focal here. And what's important is the cells that are involved. So these cells here are little hyperchromatic nuclei. Um, these are referred to as dyskeratotic cells. So dyskeratotic cells, there's two types that's classically taught. The one's cores ron. So they're going to be more rounded dyskeratotic cells. They can have paranuclear haloing with that as well more commonly seen within the granular layer, and then coarse grains. Coarse grains, again, another example of dyskeratotic cells, but their hyperchromatic nuclei is going to be more flattened, and they tend to be localized to the uh, spinous layer. So that being said, we have focal areas of acantholysis. It's not involving, you know, the majority of the epidermis. It's, you know, here it'd be more super basilar with dyskeratotic cells and follicular plugging. So that's consistent with Derrier's disease. So Derrier's disease, like Haley-Haley, is an example of an inherited acantholytic change that's going on. The gene involved is going to be ATP2A2, and that encodes for a calcium ATPase on the ER, the endoplasmic reticulum, causing the acantholytic changes. Compared to Haley-Haley, you'll see more dyskeratotic cells versus acantholysis, where Haley-Haley, you tend to see more acantholytic changes versus dyskeratosis. And then one thing to note with Derrier is another example, or to keep within your differential, uh, of the acantholytic dyskeratotic cells is a warty dyskeratoma. So a warty dyskeratoma, it's going to be more endophytic, but you will see your uh, classic uh, acantholytic dyskeratotic cells. The lesion itself tends to open up to the more superficial epidermis. And then with derriers, you see multifocal areas of involvement within the epidermis. So another example of an acantholytic process whereby you're getting it from inherited um, mutation. And then slide number five here, a punch biopsy, we have a thickened dermis. So location-wise, which will help, we're likely on a uh, proximal upper extremity or trunk. And we can already see the inflammatory infiltrate that's ongoing. Crossing within the overlying stratocordium, epidermal hyperplasia. And we can see the areas of acantholysis that are involved are focal. So as we go to higher magnification on this one here, we also see some dyskeratotic cell changes. 
And what's helpful in this disease or to make the diagnosis are the inflammatory cellular infiltrates within the dermis. So eosinophils are going to be present. So putting that together, a lesion on the trunk or, you know, upper proximal extremity of a spot that was either, you know, rubbed or chronically traumatized with focal areas of acanthalysis and dyskeratotic cells and uh, eosinophils within the dermis. This is consistent with Grover's disease. So Grover's disease or transient acanthalytic dermatoses is another example of an acanthalytic process. There's certain subtypes uh, on histology that you can see. You can see a pemphigus uh, variant. You can see a Haley Haley variant. You can see a Darius variant. You can see all three present at once. But again, just another example of an acanthalytic process that's ongoing. Eosinophils are helpful for the diagnosis and also tend to explain probably why the patients are so pruritic. So slide number six here, another punch biopsy. We can already see the inflammatory infiltrate that's ongoing with some hemorrhagic erythrocytes present as well. And we can already start to appreciate the vesicular lesion that's occurring within the epidermis. So on higher magnification, we can see that the keratinocyte cytoplasm is a little more pale with the acanthalytic changes that are nearby. So whenever you see paling of the cytoplasm with acanthalytic cells, you should start to think about a ballooning degeneration causing the acanthalysis. And then here, what's going to be helpful are the uh, cellular changes that we see. So this is referred to as the three M's for this disease process. So chromatin margination, nuclear molding, and then multinucleate cells. So that's consistent with a herpes simplex virus infection. We can also see ballooning degeneration that's going down the hair follicle as well. So herpes simplex virus infection, you can also see cautery A bodies, which are intranuclear inclusion bodies, uh, also seen with CMV and varicella. And then uh, sometimes you may hear that a more inflammatory infiltrate within the dermis can kind of help distinguish between herpes simplex versus varicella. So another example of acanthalysis, but this is different from the previous entities that we've talked about. This is more of a ballooning degeneration from a viral infection. And then moving on to the last one here. So we have another, we have a punch biopsy or excuse me, a shave biopsy. We notice that we're on an acral surface, focal area of pathology that's occurring. The adjacent epidermis appears to be spared some spongiosis and elongation of the reedy ridges, but we can see a focal area of involvement here. We already noticed that there's also, again, hemorrhagic erythrocytes that are present in an inflammatory infiltrate. There's also some superficial papillary dermal edema that's ongoing. So as we go to higher magnification, similar to the epidermis that we saw in the last slide, this is consistent with a ballooning degeneration but we don't have the three M's that are present for a herpes simplex virus infection. So if we start to piece this together, we have a focal area of involvement, a ballooning degeneration. We have nearby epidermis of the adjacent, uh, or excuse me, nearby adjacent spongiosis of the epidermis, superficial papillary dermal edema, hemorrhagic erythrocytes, and inflammation on an acral surface. You should start to think about hand foot mouth disease, which is this disease process here. So another example of an infectious etiology causing ballooning degeneration and eventual acanthalytic changes uh, commonly seen in children, um, and the common agent is Coxsackie A16. So another example of an infectious agent causing your ballooning degeneration and acanthalysis. So that being said, we went over some autoimmune causes, some inherited causes, and then some infectious causes that you can see with acanthalytic changes to keep within your differential diagnosis. Um, I hope this was helpful. Uh, thank you for everyone to, for tuning in. Thank you again to Dr. Davis and to Sages Diagnostics. Uh, if you have any questions, you can forward them over to Dr. Davis and he'd be happy to send them to me. But otherwise, I uh, hope everybody has a great night. Take care.